superficially, David Winter's 1986 film Thrashin' is a skateboarding-themed version of Martha Coolidge's Valley Girl, though it more conspicuously emphasizes the rival clan elements from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. The dialogue is terrible, even by 80s teen romance standards. That wild Indian picture happens to be styling. You don't know what you're talking about. Despite its many faults, part of what venerates Thrash into cult status is that its skateboarding montages are a cinematic remake of Pal Peralta's first two films, The Bones Brigade Video Show and Future Primitive. With Stacy Peralta on board as second unit director and Tony Alva credited as technical advisor, it's only proper that the San Fernando Valley versus Venice Beach rivalry assumes a prominent role in thrashing. This divide is expressed figuratively rather than geographically. Yeah, well, I knew him when he was Ralph and he lived in the valley, man. Now he's monk and he thinks he's cool. The ramp locals, whose halfpipe is located within pushing distance from rival Dagger's beachside headquarters, couldn't live further north than Pacific Palisades. Dagger's leader, Tommy Hook, despite his seething localism, is originally from Indiana. You don't see those kind of freaks in Indiana. Protagonist Corey Webster is the odd man out. He's neither the Val Geek nor Venice Thug, but seems well known within the skate scene. How you doing? What are you doing in our town? But as a Tracker Trucks proponent, he's an honorary Val. Corey's love interest Chrissy is equally out of place. The Midwestern prom queen at a ne'er-do-well gathering only reinforces her urban naivete. Though faithfully Shakespearean, any further semblance to Valley Girl ends here. Chrissy and Corey's night on the town, strolling past peep shows and bonded shops, illustrates that the city is new for both of them. Some of the closely filmed wide-angle shots almost resemble a skate video. It's as if we're seeing the young couple through the guileless lens of Lance Mountain while he skates through Hollywood in the first Bones video. Director Dave Winters must have been impressed enough with Stacy Peralta that he employed him to recreate the city street skating sequences from Future Primitive for Thrashin'. Instead of downtown Manhattan, we see Lance Mountain and Steve Caballero donning wigs as ramp locals, snaking through pedestrians along the Hollywood Walk of Stars. I'm certain this is not as coppice. No one else did one foot 180 slides. This part of the film looks unlike a studio production. Here, Thrashin serves as a blueprint for future skate videographers in urban settings. Skate followed camera work, super wide lenses, low angles, and bystander shots for context. By the 1986 release date of Thrashin, skateboarding had grown in popularity and labels such as street style and vert began to define skaters. Meanwhile, fringe subcategories such as downhill and freestyle were fading into obscurity. Freestyle, come on. A perhaps unintended positive consequence of drawing from earlier Bones videos was showcasing backyard ramps or just the idea of cruising down the street without spot destinations in mind. The LA Massacre downhill race exemplifies this facet of anachronistic skateboarding and thrashing. The Del Mar Bowl contest, shown earlier in the film, would have provided a more apt setting for the ending than a race. When the film first hit theaters, the last few skate parks in the United States were on the verge of closure and quality backyard ramps were few and far between. Del Mar Skate Ranch was demolished 11 months after Thrashin's premiere. Captured here are pristine clips of Alan Losey during his heyday at the Keyhole. Christian Hasoy spins a huge McTwist and lands on tile for a perfect run while simultaneously hanging with the daggers to sabotage Corey. The raw footage from this session must be languishing in a vault somewhere, if not destroyed. Despite the faithfully captured and performed skateboarding and thrashing, this cheesy 80s low-budget teen romance could have easily been forgotten if not for the accurate cultural elements. Were the filmmakers fascinated with idiosyncrasies that we pass off as normal, or does skateboarding imitate the art it claims to revile? 
Yo, man, now we're just like the guys in Thrashen. Real great. The ramp locals in Thrashen are not true San Fernando Valley dwellers. Long before the valley became a middle-class refuge from ever-increasing urban rents, Bose and his friends represented the everyboy element of skateboarding's growing third wave. Their dayglow boards, die-cut grip tape, checkered vans, and patterned shorts brand them as posers. The ramp locals are still dedicated skateboarders, typical of the multitudes of suburban kids who bought pink vision t-shirts or $99 completes from CCS catalogs to display their tribal allegiance. Tyler's Thrasher shirt could only be mail-ordered at a time when the magazine was still published on newsprint. And Corey's jock sensibilities are tempered by his SST Records t-shirt, a gateway punk label to any young 80s skater. When the daggers first crest atop the hill, it may be difficult for us to believe that their look wasn't entirely the creation of a Hollywood wardrobe designer. Hook and his gang soiled attire seem to be carefully curated to contrast against Bozo's sun-bleached perm and loud sweater. The Dagger's aesthetic actually mimics obscure skate crews of the early 1980s who weathered skateboarding's second death. Their crudely patched denim jackets are similar to those worn by the Jacks, a Northern California and Pacific Northwest-based Hells Angels-style skate team whose members also play stuntmen and thrashing. Considering that technical advisor Tony Alva once served as Jack's president, the line between fiction and reality fades until the dialogue reminds us that this is still a corny movie. Beat it, you voucher. The backstory to the female daggers is much more complicated than expressed on screen. Except for Velvet, played by Cheryl and Finn, all are nameless and uncredited. You wouldn't know from watching the movie, but an all-girl skate gang called The Hags actually inspired Alan Sachs to write the screenplay to Thrashin. Their visibility can be counted in fractions of seconds. According to Hags member Guardia Fox, from a 2017 article in Bust Magazine, it was a feminist statement. We wanted to encourage girls to skate and show we weren't just girlfriends of skaters. Though Thrashin betrayed that ethos, perhaps the time is ripe to film a reinvention from the women's point of view. To complement the genuine wardrobe, a clueless Hollywood production could easily have promoted department store brands, not unlike Marty McFly's cheap Volterra skateboard in Back to the Future. How you like them apples? Even a director who performs his due diligence diminishes his credibility by hiring a clueless production assistant to mount trucks on backwards. Whoa. But the brands and signature equipment in Thrashin are legitimate. Tyler's neon green John Lacerra Madrid gesture is authentic as are the Dagger's namesake Alvas, along with their custom grip jobs. Even the disproportionate ratio of broken Veriflexes matches my own memory of 80s backyard ramp boneyards. Trucks and wheels show wear in all the right places, which leads me to believe that the extras brought their own boards. While it's unlikely that Corey could win a downhill race with his daily rider, I'll allow the artistic license, since he only came to LA with the bare necessities. Hey, who's the geese? Things get murky when Sam Flood of Smash Skates pulls up in his white van. The child molester archetype of an 80s skate industry robber baron seems spot on, but the brand looks suspect. Their awful logo is a parody of an already dreadful bad boy club character from 80s surfwear giant Life's a Beach. Even non-skateboarding viewers would have been confused at Smash Skates allure when popular brands such as Vision and Santa Cruz produced classic images with universal appeal under the art direction of Greg Evans and Jim Phillips, respectively. And in context of Mondo's or Lacero's or VCJ's well-crafted art, we wonder why Corey isn't entertaining other offers. While it is plausible that the fictional Smash Skates may have seen limited success in the real world, that plain flat deck is a reject, left over from an antiquated early 80s mold and unless Sam Flood represents evil incarnate, tempting Corey to eat from the forbidden fruit, it's incredulous that Corey ignores so many red flags. Go ahead, bite that. Sick your teeth into it. This softcore scene between Corey and Chrissy doesn't seem to end. It's almost as if the director was contractually obligated to play Let the Love Begin in its entirety. Get 
then Garland Jeffries' Wild in the Streets cranks into the Circle Jerks version to re-redeem the film. This excellent architectonic angle evokes the San Diego Concourse parking garage's heavily skated spiral ramp. But how are these artistically disparate scenes the work of the same director and screenwriter? The minds who orchestrated an intense chase sequence to a punk anthem couldn't possibly believe that an obligatory romantic montage was a good idea. Otherwise, the Red Hot Chili Peppers is fitting, as their funk-influenced sound resonated with mid-80s skaters. Still, I'm surprised that tracks from the Welcome to Venice compilation did not make this soundtrack. At the very least, the filmmakers could have tied Venice Beach skateboarding to hometown heroes' suicidal tendencies, who had already attained some level of national success. We can't forget that Thrashin was made to appeal to a broad market. Thus, the heroic qualities of Hollywood characters defy what we value within our subculture of our favorite prose. Corey Webster may be a shoo-in for the mainstream, but as a skateboarder, his ambition to turn pro is excessive. And these are the nuances that an outsider may never understand. Before Nike or Mountain Dew began to assert control over skateboarding, the path to professionalism was more akin to becoming a monk or dog walker. It was just something you fell into, with no guarantee of steady pay. Not that people did not aspire to win contests or become competitive with each other over new tricks, but recognition came from within the community. Many intangible variables, such as style or creativity, cannot be recorded through contest placings and definitely can't be conveyed through even the best actors. It's unrealistic to expect Josh Brolin or Robert Russler to possess any skateboard skills whatsoever. They're actually not that bad, but the actors playing the ramp locals just look too stiff and awkward to match their stunt doubles. Finally, there are some inexcusable aspects of thrashing, which push it into a so bad it's good category of cold classic instead of just being good. I'm glad the director wasn't paying attention when non-speaking extra Eddie Radigi steals the scene here. One of the biggest points of ridicule is the infamous joust at Bronson Canyon Ditch. <laughs> I suppose this is the best idea that writers Paul Brown and Alan Sachs could imagine to incorporate the violent duel between the Capulets and Montagues from Romeo and Juliet. Corey attempts to avenge Tyler's symbolic death after their halfpipe is destroyed. Punishment by proxy for Corey's forbidden romance. The daggers are probably way too excited about burning a viable spot. One guy literally loses his shirt over it. In reality, I think Hook and Pals would just skate the ramp clandestinely and leave empty beer cans instead of destroy it. Returning to the joust, it's obvious that the skate consultants couldn't convince the filmmakers that swinging a pillow from a chain was a bad idea. At some point during the filming, the cast and crew must have eventually realized the lunacy of this. So they directed the actors to ditch the lances and just beat the shit out of each other instead. Thrashin may have been informed by a slightly earlier period, but by no means was its skateboarding obsolete. As much as the movie emphasizes competition, the filmmakers thankfully also chose to accentuate Lance Mountain's approach of urban skating for the sake of pure enjoyment. A decade earlier, C.R. Stesic III theorized, somewhere beyond the formalized spectrum, street skating reigns supreme. We see glimpses of proto-street skating in Thrashin with Hasoy, Jesse Martinez, and Riadigi at the old Venice Beach Pavilion restrooms. The dagger's wanton misuse of public property could only be perceived as rebellious from the minds of unobservant viewers. The city of Venice abandoned the once thriving community recreation center and outdoor amphitheater in 1984 and opened the floodgates for street musicians, graffiti artists, and street skaters. Adaptive reuse would be a more precise term although probably not in the manner that urban planners and architectural scholars had envisioned. The nostalgic appeal of Thrashin has less to do with the movie than the rapid progression of skateboarding during the mid-80s. Paul Peralta's third video, The Search for Animal Chin, 
premiered less than a year later, but there were no more downhill sessions or skate park contests. Instead, brief clips of San Francisco sidewalk boulevards and Embarcadero Plaza sparked the possibilities of what could be accomplished beyond Masonite monoliths. Our initial reactions of thrashing, as predictable and uninspired, has been tempered by our realization that meager moving images of skateboarding exist from 1986. Thus thrashing is now venerated, via its wig stuntmen, as a pseudo-documentary of an influential era.